Welcome back to the uh, next episode of the Be Ready Utah Prep Cast. This is part two of our first aid episode. Uh, we've been talking about first aid for day-to-day emergencies and incidents, and we're going to be talking more today about mass care incidents or d- large-scale disasters and those types of things. Back with me again are Catherine McMullen and Jeff Johnson from the Division of Emergency Management uh, Outreach Specialist. I'm Wade Matthews, the Be Ready Utah Manager, and let's just get into it again. Large-scale emergencies, large-scale disasters, what are we talking about here? We've got earthquakes, we've got tornadoes, we've right. got... Possibly active shooter. There's a lot okay. of different scenarios that could cause a lot of in- injuries. We could talk about the, the Las Vegas um, Route 91 shooting. And Kathy, if you want to explain what you were talking about earlier about that. Sure. Uh, in Las Vegas, they had the active shooter incident, and there was over 500 injuries. Um, there were 54 fatalities. It was a devastating situation, but I think what's important to learn from that scenario is that about 80% of the injured individuals were transported to the hospital by bystanders, by you and me just helping each other. And uh, that one to three, five minutes that it takes you to get to the hospital could be critical in being able to slow that bleeding down and get them some life-saving care before you even get to the hospital. And that really takes us to really the definition of, uh, of a disaster in the first place. Not saying that Las Vegas was overwhelmed, but in a, an earthquake scenario, for example, sure. our resources will be overwhelmed. We, uh, Jeff mentioned earlier in part one, uh, be the help until help arrives. And in a large-scale disaster situation, that could be a long time. That could be hours or days before help, professional help arrives, right? So we need to be that ha- that help. Or and even the roads getting to you might be tricky, so you're going to have to be that help until help arrives. The closest hospital might not be available because a bridge or an overpass or some other obstacles in the way. The other thing, when you arrive at the hospital, um, they're going to be doing an, an unusual triaging. It's a not a normal day-to-day thing, uh, thing. You have to have two criteria to get into that hospital, and let's explain why. If there are 350 beds, and yet there are 1,350 people arriving at the hospital, they can't treat everybody. And so they are going to be triaging that on a, on a disaster scale, and that would be that you have to have a life-threatening injury, and that life-threatening injury has to be survivable. So those are the two criteria that are gonna, that are gonna be the, uh, the criteria for getting in. What does that mean? You might have a normal injury that you'd get into a hospital for every day, like a broken leg or a large laceration, and they might be turning you away or treating you in the parking lot, and you're not going to be uh, again admittance to the hospital. This furthers the reason of why we need to be able to treat people where they are injured at, which is what CERT teams do, which is what MRC does, and we can talk about that, but, it, but having the ability to uh, stabilize a broken bone or, or stop bleeding from a laceration not at the hospital site, but away from a hospital is very important. You mentioned CERT, Community Emergency Response Teams, and MRC, Medical Reserve Corps. Yes. Good, two good resources and places actually where you can get uh, this disaster first aid training so that we can be the help until help arrives. We can be treating our friends and neighbors, family members, where they're injured at before the professionals arrive. And I think it's important to get the whole family involved. I'm sorry, but it, it, it's kind of fun to do a CERT training with your whole family. Strapping mom to a backer board and, and carrying her down the stairs, it's kind of fun. Yeah. And it gives you all that basic information that you can share together and review together and help each other. Yeah, yeah exactly. So again, in a disaster situation, the, the three killers that we talked about in part one, they still apply. Those are still the same things. You mentioned having to be required to get into a hospital are the same things that we're looking for in our neighborhoods to save lives, the three killers, the ABS, airway, bleeding, and shock, right? So we're not, again, talking about how to do that here in this short time that we have, but get the training, the knowledge. Sorry, I was just going to say stop the bleed. Um, Really, really good training that's going out multiple times a week from the health department all over the state. It's free. It's a two-hour course. And it teaches you how to keep somebody alive if they're bleeding. And I, th- I think everybody ought to take that training as much as they can. It puts the emphasis on tourniquets and packing the wounds, right? Something that we, we kind of avoided in the past. Right. It's kind of scary. And I, I have children. We're family. And, and that can be scary. But if you introduce it in the right way and you give them the confidence to act, you empower them to act, it becomes less and less scary. And, and I quiz my kids all the time. What if his injury was here? What if the injury was here? How would mm-hmm. you deal with that to my my youth and and it has proven valuable to them right exactly 
you shared that story with us yeah. in part one as well. Sure. So the first aid kits, the emergency equipment, is it different in a disaster or is it the same thing from the day to day? The, a first aid kit is a first aid kit. We need the rolled gauze and the bandages and tape and those types of I'd things. I'd say you need the same stuff, more of it. Yeah, more <laughs> of it. It's the number of injured people that's gonna cause the problem. And that's why if there's a CERT team and everybody brings equipment and first aid supplies and you have 10, 12, 15, 20 people show up keep bringing, bringing the supplies, then you can treat everybody that's injured. I have items here, like I keep this under my desk. I could not treat our whole office with this. Other people are gonna need to have first aid supplies in their offices for us to treat everybody here if an earthquake were to happen in this building in this area. I was just going to say it's also great why it's great to have a good tourniquet or two or three, yes. but also it's great to have the education and the knowledge of how to improvise a tourniquet. And so we teach all of those things. How do you use what you, the, the equipment that you have and how do you improvise if the event is large scale? And the thought occurs to me, do you need to have first aid training in order to have a first aid kit? Not no, yet. you do not. <laughs> not Would it be helpful to say, hey, I've got some supplies. I don't, here, I haven't received the training, but here, use my, all these bandages. I've got this right. bandage. Right. You know, if you're, maybe you're the victim and you've <laughs> got a first aid kit in kit. the car. Yeah, get my kit out of the car or under the desk or whatever. We should all have first aid supplies for these mass, mass disasters, you know, mass care situations. I love having a grab-and-go medical kit, so something that is at my home if I need to help my neighbors and community, that beyond the kit that I have in my emergency pack, in my car, in my desk at work, as you mentioned in the other uh, part one, um, but also something that I could grab at home, and it has a large amount of supplies that we could help each other. Okay. So uh, the disaster after the disaster is disease. Mm. So especially those of us that might be out treating Lots of injuries, stopping bleeding, opening airways, treating shock. Uh, what are we doing to prevent disease? Personal protection equipment. You need to have, first and foremost, a, a pair of nitro gloves. We don't recommend vinyl or latex, latex gloves, but yeah. I have some right here in, the pants, in my pants pocket. I carry them with me every day okay. because I have a little pocket. I just keep them there. And to have gloves is probably the first and foremost thing because you're going to be putting your hands on whoever's injured and to protect yourself, keep your hands. But there's other things. You can get, get a pair of goggles or just a pair of glasses to, to protect your eyes a and to be conscientious if you have a spurting or bleeding arterial wound uh, to position yourself away where you won't get sprayed by that. So there's, there's training and there's equipment, but PPE is very, very important for your personal hygiene. And, and the masks? Right. you. I would add the masks beyond. It's also gonna give you a protective barrier when you're doing first aid. But if you're experiencing something like um, some event that has debris, an earthquake, or any time the ground moves or buildings have collapsed, you're going to have a lot of debris in the air, and you can't help somebody else if you're choking on it. So that equipment's very important. Dust particles, mm -hmm. exactly. And then I will add to all of this as well is wash your hands often, sure. right? Wash yeah. your hands often. If we've got, that's a good, again, uh, promotion for water storage, <laughs> lots of water, you know, so we can wash our hands and uh, along with all the other stuff we're using our water for in a disaster. If I may too, these are very, very inexpensive. This is iodine prep pads. It will help both clean out a wound and then you can use them to clean yourself as well. This is a triple uh, antibiotic ointment. Again, these are cheap, can be kept anywhere, and they're very, very important for sterilizing uh, a wound if you're, you're talking about hygiene. Okay, great. I think uh, we're getting about out of time here, but again, this is not meant to be a first aid training video, but more of a promotion. People, awareness that there's needs out there, that they can get training, that we need to have supplies and equipment on hand. We want to encourage and, and prom uh, promote that so people can go out and, and, and put those things in place, right? And I, would, and I would add to it, you know, if you're the only one in your family and your community that's trained, you can only do so much again and you could be injured. So make sure that your family is trained. If you're not home or if you're not in that event, that, that it's a community event because we all need to help each other. Right. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Catherine, appreciate uh, your being here, sharing your great knowledge and experience. Uh, again, you can watch these episodes on our Be Ready YouTube channel, uh, see them on Facebook, on Twitter, and on our, our website, BeReadyUtah.gov. Uh, next month, our next episode is on safety and security. Make sure you tune in for that. You can watch all of our past episodes again on our Be Ready YouTube channel. And uh, make sure you give us some comments. If you have any questions you'd like us to address, put them in the comments on any of those uh, social media uh, methods. And thanks for watching. Hey, hope you enjoyed this episode of the Be Ready Utah PrepCast. Like what you're seeing? 
Have a question about anything related to emergency preparedness? Or do you have a comment about something you've learned as you make a plan or get a kit? We'd love to hear from you. Comment or reply to us on Twitter or Facebook at Be Ready Utah with hashtag BRUPrepCast or in the comments on YouTube. We'll talk about it on one of the next episodes of the Be Ready Utah PrepCast. Don't forget to share these videos and your own adventures in preparedness with your friends, family, neighbors, and coworkers. Because anytime is a good time to talk about emergency preparedness. See you next time.